Welcome back to the Aaron Wren Show. I'm your host, Aaron Wren. There have been a ton of articles, podcasts, etc. recently talking about the evangelical elite and the failures of the evangelical elite. And I wanted to you know, weigh in on that topic myself. So there's going to be a fire hose of information for you today. Some of you can see this on video. I'm holding up my notes. I have three pages of notes like just bullets that I took saying all the things I want to cover uh, in this today. I actually do put in some preparation uh, for this podcast. Usually I don't just sit here and start start talking. I actually say, what do I want to talk to? A little outline and, and try to do it. And so now that I'm on video again, maybe you'll see me with my notes. Uh, I need to get a teleprompter or something like that. So I'm always looking straight at the camera, but uh, I, I hope you enjoy it. So there were, again, a lot of articles out there uh, recently on evangelical elites. The first one that I saw was actually in the American Reformer. It was called The Evangelical Embarrassment Reflex by John Errett. And I don't know if I'm quite pronouncing his name correctly. Uh, that article did great for us. Uh, I think it's the most popular article we put up to date. It, it really kind of took off uh, and got a lot of shares. Then there was a piece in The American Conservative by Jack Waters and Emma Posey uh, on evangelical elites. And that was a very important article because it prompted Mark Galley, the former editor-in-chief of Christianity Today magazine, to uh, write in his newsletter some ruminations on the evangelical elite that really went viral and caused a lot of controversy. And then uh, it, it just so happens that an article by Carl Truman called The Failure of the Evangelical Elites, I think it is, it's in First Things magazine, uh, came out right after that. And that had to have been a coincidence because that was in the print edition. So it had to have been, you know, in the works for a while. But that hit. And then, you know, some people started weighing in on it. So there are a couple of podcasts that did good episodes on this. Uh, one was a, an episode of a podcast called, I think it's called Life Books and Everything. Uh, it's Kevin DeYoung, Colin Hansen, and Justin Taylor, I think. It's hosted on the Gospel Coalition. I, I don't usually listen to that one, but Whenever I see like an interesting title or something on it, I sometimes check it out. Uh, and uh, also a, a podcast called Mere Fidelity with Matthew Lee Anderson and Derek Rishmaui and Alistair Roberts also did an uh, episode on that, uh, also with a lot of good thoughts. And so that's a ton of material, and I'm going to put it all in the show notes, links to all of that, so you can take a look at it. And what Alistair made a really good point in the podcast, and I think other people kind of hit this, is... Everything today trying to sort of treats the elite, being elite as a pejorative, right? It's like bad to be an elite. We don't want elites. Well, in fact, we do want elites. You know, being an elite is a good thing. I think even in the Bible, it says he who aspires to become an elder uh, seeks a good thing. So there's nothing wrong with being elite. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be the elite. Uh, there's just some questions about, you know, who the elite are and whether they're any good. So that's what I want to look at today. One, I want to look at this question, who are the evangelical elite? And secondly, are they doing a good job? And so there's a whole field out there of elite theory. And I won't claim to be a deep expert on elite theory. I mean, you could do a PhD in elite theory if you wanted to. But I have done some writing in the space. And many of you are probably familiar with the major retrospective of the work that I did on the sociologist E. Digby Baltzell. And not a lot of people know him today, but he is the one who really popularized the term WASP for white Anglo-Saxon Protestant and is the foremost scholar, in my opinion, in American history of American elites and the upper class. So maybe I'll put a link to that article as well uh, in the show notes. You, you can check it out. So Baltzell defines what he means by an elite. Baltzell's elite are a collection of individuals who hold the senior most positions in the key institutions and domains of society. So I will repeat that. The elite are individuals who occupy the senior most positions in the key institutions and domains of society. And of course that, you know, immediately prompts the question, right? Well, what, what do you mean by senior most positions and what are the key domains of society? And I'll look at each of these questions. And Baltzell really makes a distinction between what he calls the elite and the wealthy and the upper class. So someone who's wealthy has a lot of money. They may not be an elite 
in the sense that they may not occupy one of these positions. They may just be some trust funder who's just hanging out. They may not occupy an elite position. Uh, or you know, conversely, the upper class, in his view, was a collection of families who were descended from elites of one or more generations ago. And you can think of uh, an upper class as a sort of hereditary aristocracy, as we may see in some of these British dra dramas and things like that. And so Balzer really looked at the dynamics of how the elite, the wealthy, and the upper class interplayed with each other over time. And he was a big critic of the American elite and the way they were going. And one of the reasons he, he, did, he didn't think it was going the right way was that the elite was becoming declassed uh, in the sense that, for example, in the era of the Protestant establishment, many of the people who held elite positions were from prominent upper class families. And his definition of an establishment, what does it mean to be an establishment, is when members of the upper class hold a significant number of the positions in the elite and sort of dominate it culturally. And that's long gone in America. And I think it's, it's important to know, too, in kind of the evangelical world, we don't have an upper class. For one thing, uh, Baltzell always pointed out, any society only has one upper class. There are many middle classes, many other kinds of classes, but there's only one upper class. I do think it's, it's interesting to note that there are a lot of what you might call second and third generation people in prominent positions in evangelicalism. So uh, there are children and grandchildren of Billy Graham uh, who are prominent today. Uh, you know, uh, Barnabas Piper, I think John Piper's son works, I think he works for Lifeway, uh, you know, so he's got a position um, there. T Tim Keller's son, Michael, uh, pastors one of the new Redeemer locations. Uh, you know, and there's others, they all, you know, their kids get, get jobs, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's good, but we shouldn't, one of the things I want to be clear is that there is not a hereditary aristocracy in evangelicalism, you know, by virtue of being somebody's kid. You know, there's no community. It's, it's not at all like the upper class. I don't want to go into any details, but you can notice these people here and there, out there, but it's not as significant as it was in the days of the upper class, and I'm not going to go into any more detail on it. So, again, what are the senior most positions, and what are the key, key domains of society? And there are essentially two different schools of thought about what constitutes the senior most positions. Uh, I might call this the senior executive theory and the managerial theory. So Baltzell viewed the senior most positions as essentially the senior executive positions. He never really defined in precise detail who qualifies as like a senior executive versus not, but you could think of it as maybe the top five guys in the company, right? The people who are really pulling down the big bucks, they got chief something officer, chief executive officer or something in their title. That person is you know, a senior most position. The president of a university is a senior most position. The world-class scholar, Nobel Prize winner in his field is the senior most position. So let's call it a senior executive view. The managerial view was really advanced by James Burnham in his book, The Managerial Revolution. What he says is basically as we had massive explosions in organizational size and complexity, this created a new need for skilled managers to know how to administer this large enterprise. And it is really this managerial class more than the senior executives who constitute the key decisive kind of ruling class, elite class in society. And so, um, you know, I, I think there's like, you know, there's ways you can think about both of these, and I think they're both important. Um, and, and so I'll go in a little more uh, detail on that in just a minute, my own point of view. But you know, I think most people have tended to argue towards kind of the senior executive position, or maybe even a, a, a layer above that, you know, which you might posit as some sort of power elite. So uh, there was a, uh, he was Italian, but he may have been born in Germany. His name was Robert Michaels. I may actually be pronouncing his name wrong. I'm just pronouncing it as if it's an English name. He coined this, uh, what he called the iron law of oligarchy, which is that basically you know, any organization, no matter how it starts or no matter what its origins, will always end up dominated by an oligarchy. There was also a uh, sociologist, C. Wright Mills, wrote a book called The Power Elite, um, who was really uh, into, into that. And, you know, I haven't read, actually, Mills has been on my, uh, my list to read for a long time. I've just never got around to him. Others in this uh, thing, there's a book called Who Rules America by uh, a guy named William Domhoff came back. 
And there's been various takes on this. You know, there was a paper a few, you know, many years ago, not many years, a couple decades ago, who rules Cincinnati? And these tend to look at things like interlocking board directors, directorships and things like that and, and pointing it. So there seems to be a big push for, you know, who are the true um, elites? I think that's that, that power elite view. It's the billionaires, right? It's the oligarchs. That tends to be it. Now, my, my view is a little different. I think elites exist on a spectrum and, uh, you know, I tend to side, but I tend to side much more with this kind of managerial thesis, but I don't believe like all managers are, are the same, right? There are, there is sort of a hierarchy, if you will, within managerialism. Some people in these senior executive roles are more influential, but that doesn't mean that people down in these junior roles um, are not. And so you could think about this, for example, in terms of a federal bureaucracy. The, sure, the cabinet secretaries, the political appointees are powerful, um, they play an important role, but in a lot of ways, the bureaucracy is decisive, right? The administrative state, the permanent civil service, uh, you know, controls things uh, in, in a powerful way. There was a, there was a kind of a famous British comedy called Yes Minister uh, that talked about this. And, you know, I don't think that's a little, that goes a little too far. You know, uh, you think about Donald Trump's, many of his appointees, yes, they were opposed by the bureaucrats uh, in their in their departments, but a lot of them were able to advance the ball because they had formal power. Um, but it's not like just the top people or just the bureaucracy rule. And I, and I would just say in general over time, because changes in, you know, senior staff happen in organizations all the time, it is really this kind of permanent staff, this managerial thing that in the long term ends up being decisive. But nevertheless, not all elites are made the same. I don't want to say because there's this managerial class, somebody who has like a title of director or senior director in their company is equivalent to the CEO. That's not the case. There is a hierarchy um, there. You think of it maybe as inner party versus outer party. And so we, we kind of looked at like who those elites are, again. You know, um, but I think we get a mistaken view of what it means to be an elite because of the way that we have this sort of monarchical mindset about it. That is to say, we view an elite as someone who has a lot of power to say what's going to happen. Somebody that has sort of ultimate decision-making power. So we would say, you know, Vladimir Putin is an elite because he's the dictator of Russia, basically. Or Xi Jinping is an elite because he's kind of the dictator of China, if you will. Or, you know, the CEO, like Mark Zuckerberg, kind of has essentially voting control of Facebook or Meta or whatever it's called now. He's the elite. He's the decider. He's got the power, right? And so we tend to think of elites in terms of wielding this sort of power. But it doesn't really work that way in the United States. It's kind of long been recognized that it doesn't work that way. There was a study done, may have actually been done in the 50s, by a guy named Robert Dahl called Who Governs. It's an interesting book. He looked at New Haven, Connecticut, and he says, who runs New Haven? There were a lot of theories on who ran New Haven. No, the unions control New Haven, or the WASP elite control New Haven, or you know, the, the CEOs of the businesses control New Haven. You know, so he's like, okay, let's study New Haven and see how it works. So he did this study and he basically came, came to the conclusion that there was no basic group of people pulling the strings in New Haven. It was sort of a participative pluralism uh, of, you know, yes, all these different classes had a say, a lot of them, but you know, the voters actually got a say too. And it was sort of collaborative and distributed and, and all of these things. And, you know, we also see that in the work of James Davison Hunter. And I, I use him a lot because he really is a smart thinker. And, you know, he's very big name in a lot of these evangelical circles. So I like, he's got a lot of respect. So I want to just use a guy that they already respect. He talks a lot about networks, right? Cultural power, and you know, I would say power in general, in Western society flows from networks, not individuals. And that doesn't mean every node on the network is equally powerful. Some nodes that are near to the cultural center are more powerful than those on the periphery, for example. Some people higher in that have more power than other, but the power resides in the network. It's distributed, and in some respects, the outcomes are an emergent property of the network. And uh, an individual person in that network may be influencing the network, but doesn't necessarily have a high um, percent, you know, high individual level of, of influence on things and their own position within that network, no matter who they are, may be precarious. We don't have a ruler like Putin or Xi Jinping or like an old school kind of wasp grandee in one of these towns. 
right? If you, you know, it doesn't matter who you are in America, right? If, if you know, if you went on TV and screamed the N word, you're toast, right? If you, you could be canceled for any number of violations uh, of, of the rule called the social rules, no matter who you are. So there's a sense, I think, of weakness, even among people who are very powerful in the elite. And I think that's one of the reasons we start looking at the fact that, you know, elites exist on a spectrum and that elite power is wielded through networks, not necessarily through individual sort of monarchical decision making. That really plays into, I think, this perception of people saying, well, I'm not elite. You know, I don't, I don't have any decision making power. So, um, you know, you see a guy, I mean, I was seeing Jake Medor, who's the editor of, um, you know, Mirror Orthodoxy, saying, oh, well, I'm not an elite. I'm just some guy who sort of edits this journal right, and it's part time. And he's right about that, right? So, but I would say, in essence, right, Jake Meter is an elite of a sort. He's in this sort of managerial class, if you will. He does hold a position in a publication, is the editor of it, but there's certainly a big difference between him and Tim Keller, right? He's more on the junior end, you know, and some of these other guys are way more on the senior end. Uh, and he's right that he doesn't control what people think. I mean, how much influence does he wield? Miss that? No, so in many ways he's weak. But I would say this, probably if you saw the world through Tim Keller's eyes, you'd be like, oh, that's Tim Keller probably thinks he's weak too. Right? He's like, I can't just snap my fingers and make people do what I want. Look, look at how much blowback I'm getting over all these tweets. And so I think that the power comes out of the network, not necessarily out of the individual, causes people, one of the things that causes people to not perceive themselves as elite. And I think they are also, you know, very attuned to how precarious their standing is within the elite. If you go back to Boltzell, one of the things that he really thought made the establishment concept very powerful is if you were born into one of these elite wasp families, you actually did have secure social status that could not be taken away from you in that era. It would have been very difficult for you to lose your social standing. And that gives you a sense of confidence and ease and a sense that, hey, I'm going to get in there. I'm going to do the job that I think is right for this country. And I'm not going to have to worry that at the end of this, if something goes wrong or it's a controversy, that I'm going to be kicked out of my club. Because it's very hard to kick me out of my club. Almost nobody gets kicked out of the club unless they do something outrageous. And so uh, today, everybody perceives their weakness. Uh, and I think even Tocqueville wrote about this. And, you know, um, Baltzell drew, drew a lot from Tocqueville. It's like, you know, atomized American society where you have to have to scramble to acquire wealth and status is very different than what you get in an, uh, an aristocratic society when, you know, the Duke is like born into that position and it can never be taken away from him. So that's powerful. Um, so... You know, that's kind of what an elite is. And the elites are uh, a spectrum of people from junior to senior occupying, you know, the key positions in, you know, the institutions, domains, and networks of society. So what are those key domains, uh, institutions, you know, networks in a society? Well, it's society at large. We could think about, obviously, uh, uh, major corporations, we could think about elite universities like Harvard, Princeton, Yale. Uh, we can think about uh, you know major media outlets, uh, the New York Times, the Washington Post. Uh, we can think about um, you know politicians, people with high elective office. Uh, we can think about people who have major so, sort of celebrity status or things of that nature, or it could be people who are leading in their professions, leading lawyers, leading doctors, leading scientists, researchers, being a Nobel Prize winning scientist, uh, for example. Uh, you know, people of that nature. And, and you know, I say uh, domains uh, because I don't think all power flows from having a box in an institution. So, yes, you know, the president of Harvard University um, has a lot of power, but some people exist maybe outside of an institutional structure, um, you know, maybe a very influential writer um, doesn't necessarily have a position, uh, for example, or a columnist for the New York Times may not have a formally high position on the org chart, but wields a lot of cultural power and status. You can think of that as incorporating status as well. And so this would be some of the key domains of society. But here's the key. There's not just one domain right, in our society. And I think much like the upper class, there was one upper class. There's kind of like one elite set of institutions for society at large. But there are many, many, many subdomains that you can trace down through society. And somebody who's a nobody in kind of society at large can actually be the most elite person in Another subdomain. So you could think about a high school, right, as a domain, and that uh, among the students in high school, right, the people who are on the football team or the basketball team, uh, all right, the quarterback of the football team is very high status. 
Uh, you can think about the people who are cheerleaders or the people who are in the different clubs or different things like that that are cool. And right, there's a whole ecosystem of status and kind of eliteness in a high school. And I think um, somebody made a quip one time that like, you know, high school and prisons are the place where sort of social status jockeying is the most toxic because there's no real stakes, right? It's like they're, they're pure status. You have no power. You have no control. You're sort of a, you're sort of a peon there. Uh, when you get in, but you get out, so you get into other domains, right? They actually, it actually means something. A business, for example, or or a church, you know, there are kind of elites within an individual church, and so I think you can look at these, you know, kind of individual subdomains. Is each could have its own elite, and obviously the dynamics are going to be different. Now, I would say, evangelicalism itself is a subdomain, but is so kind of large and diffuse, it is hard to identify a singular elite within the evangelical domain. Instead, I think you have to look at tribal or subdomain types of um, groupings to find kind of elites. So one kind of grouping would be, you know, called progressive evangelicalism, which you could think of as the, the sojourners crowd, the neo-anabaptists, you know, the new monastics, people like that. You know, they've got their own little world, their own kind of little ecosystem, and different people have different status with that. I think there's an emerging tribe, which called call exvangelicals, uh, which are distinct from that. And they have their own little world, their own little tribe. There's New Calvinism uh, that has its own thing. Um, you know, that was thus, uh, the, talked about Brad Vermerlin in his book. Uh, he did his, uh, about it. And, you know, he um, you know, he's did his uh, PhD thesis on that, become an expert on, on kind of New Calvinist movement. And I think even within this sort of like, you know, what Vermerlin labeled mainstream evangelicalism, which you might think of as many of these non-denom suburban megachurches, there are all these tribes. So, you know, I, you know I, when I was in New York, I visited Hillsong a number of times. Probably went there probably 10 times. Maybe half the time they had a guest speaker. And it was always some super dynamic, you know, evangelist or pastor of another church. And, you know, they do a bunch of conferences. And I bet if you looked at who speaks at the Hillsong conferences, you know, and who speaks at their church, that would uncover kind of a network, um, you know, that exists around around them. You know, these different sorts of affiliations. I bet if you look at different conferences, just mapping out conference speakers and mapping out guest pastor appearances, probably map out a lot of networks that aren't necessarily as visible. And even some of the visible networks would, would probably be as well. So I think it's tough to speak of an elite, except of an evangelicalism at large, but you can speak of elites within some of these sub communities and Vermerlin again sort of views many of these sub communities as in essence jockeying for a position within a broader evangelical field um, you can read his book if you're interested actually go to the, you know my YouTube channel and listen to the you know uh, great interview that that we did he had a lot of uh, fantastic things to say so that's what I say you know when you talk about elites you have to be talking about what subdomain within evangelicalism are you talking about and uh, I think a lot of people throw around a term, Big Eva, and when they're talking about evangelical elites, you know, I think a lot of people have this Big Eva group in mind. And Big Eva is essentially coterminous with the new Calvinist group or the gospel, you know, a gospel industrial complex, as other people have called them, that sort of thing. So it's, it's denominational leaders, it's big pastors, it's wealthy financiers, it's seminary people, it's publishing executives, uh, it's big authors and journalists, uh, it's holders of elite secular roles, people like that. So again, I think you could look at the conferences in this sort of world, you know, look at the Gospel Coalition conferences, Together for the Gospel, look at a lot of these conferences and say, who's speaking? That probably gives you a good sense of the structure of the elites within this field. And I do think this group has had more power concentrated at the senior levels uh, than in some other groups. Like I think that the progressive evangelicals are a lot more distributed. I think the ex-evangelicals are more distributed. Of course, they, they may develop uh, more hierarchical structures over time. You know, we'll just see the ex-evangelical thing's kind of new. And so, um, you know, so I think that's that. So I think there, this, who is the elite? Um, I think if you talk about, you know, Big Eva, uh, you're talking about a subdomain of evangelicalism that is predominantly new Calvinist that involves all these people who are involved in these major organs, you know, parachurch groups like Gospel Coalition, I forgot to throw that in there, etc. So that's who we would talk about as an elite. And again, within that elite, it's a network 
And individuals within that network, you know, aren't all equal, but they aren't necessarily all powerful either. You know, again, you know, Don Carson cannot snap his fingers and make people do things, right? He may have a lot of power within the Gospel Coalition still. I don't know. He's retired from there, but like, probably still has some influence. But like, this idea, like, well, you know, we'll just we'll just we'll just make John Piper do what I say. They can't do that. It's a network, and you know, your network, you're standing within the network, right? You know, some some people have more solid than others, but you kind of have to you have to be in it. So that's kind of who are the evangelical elite. And you could think about it in terms of different tribes. If you wanted to look at it, elites, you could look at it different kinds of elites in different subsections of evangelicalism. Uh, I think one reason that the new Calvinist people get so much press is because these folks have been much better at building connections to secular elite media. And that is essentially a force multiplier, right, for you, is when, you've, when you have you know, a byline or a friendly article in, call it, the, you know, the, the New York Times or the Washington Post, then, you know, that makes you look pretty good. Well, wow, that's pretty impressive. And, and so th those are the sorts of things that I think, you know, give them a lot of standing. They got, they got that, a lot of big names there. So the next question is, are they doing a good job? <laughs> and I think this is where, like, I think uh, it's highly diverse in terms of, you know, whether or not they are doing a good job. I think you have to look at the individuals. I think some people are doing a very lousy job. And, you know, I would use Russell Moore uh, as an example of that. It's interesting that in, uh, you know, in the Mere Fidelity podcast, you know, Alistair Roberts defends Russell Moore. He's like, you know, Russell Moore may not feel that his job is essentially to, to defend his people. He feels his job is to declare the gospel. And, you know, maybe he feels that way now, but, you know, back in 2015 when he was writing articles in the New York Times trashing, you know, evangelicals who voted for Trump, which, by the way, 80% of them did, um, you know, he was actually the paid representative of the SBC, right? He ran their policy lobbying arm, basically. He was the chief policy officer of the SBC, essentially. So, yeah, his job actually was to rep his people, and instead he trashed them. And this idea that the elites, you know, do not have to, you know, identify with, you know, represent, et cetera, the people that they purportedly lead um, I think is arguably the most pernicious idea in America today. We have an elite that views themselves as completely apart um, from the people in many respects. Uh, very much, very few of them make it very clear they do not like, you know, large chunks of the American people. And that's a real problem in our country. Uh, you know, when you have elites that are so disconnected and often hostile to, as with, you know, Russell Moore, hostile to the very people whose ties are paying his salary. So I think the people who are going into these secular publications and trashing other Christians are definitely people who are not doing good things. And I believe they actually, you know, do have a duty to think about the people that they purport to lead. Now, not everybody is an institutional leader. Moore is definitely on the, you know, far end of the spectrum because he held a position as the head of the policy arm of the SBC. But a lot of other people have essentially major roles as well, and you need to think about that. I think other people are doing quite well. Kevin DeYoung, you know, is in that Life, Books, and Everything podcast, I think he is doing a really great job. Um, I think he is a guy who's sort of starting to discern this new cultural moment which we find ourselves, and he has actually been changing and adapting and trying to speak into it uh, in very powerful ways, and I, I think his profile is rising in part because he is doing that. He is figuring out how to adapt to this very different circumstances that we have. And, you know, he's changed. It's not just that he's sort of figuring out how to contextualize things. He's a guy who's changed. Uh, you know, when I started uh, The Masculinist way back when, whenever that was, one of the one of my very earliest readers attended his church in Michigan. It's like, Aaron, I got to find a way to put you in touch with my pastor, Kevin DeYoung. This guy is so blue pill. He's so bad. And I've actually many times cited an article that DeYoung wrote back in 2011 called Dude, Where's My Bride? It's got a lot of, uh, uh, Dude, Where's Your Bride? It's got a lot of quotable stuff in it. But, you know, I need to stop citing that article. I think I'm just going make to make a note to myself here. Don't cite that article anymore. Right? It was, first, it was 10 years ago. I, I don't know for sure, obviously, and I wouldn't expect him to publicly disavow it. But I think, you know what? Kevin DeYoung probably wouldn't write that article today. 
I think he's changed. I mean, now he's talking a lot about substantive complementarity of the genders. I'm like, oh, tell me more about that. I wasn't hearing that out of them back then. Now, maybe he was, but I feel like he's really upgraded his software, right, in some important ways. And like, oh, yeah, now I see that we have to take stronger stands on these other issues where maybe in the past we were trying to triangulate. The triangulation is not going to work anymore. Hey, maybe we need to just um, upgrade our software and be a little more bold. And he is. He is being bold. And so I put, you know, Kevin DeYoung on the definitely moving in the right direction list, doing a good job uh, within evangelicalism. Then there's another group of people um, that I think are the old kind of retirement age boomer leaders like Keller and Piper, who I think have struggled to adapt to what I had called the negative world, this new cultural moment. You know, the ground really shifted under the feet, I think, of the church in, in recent years. And these guys have sort of not been able to adapt to it. And so they are becoming much, much more the target of criticism that they never received in the past. I mean, I've been following uh, Tim Keller since probably 2010. And, you know, even as recently as 2015, like, I, I never heard anybody criticize this guy. Anybody. And I mean, if you criticized Tim Keller, people would be like, oh my gosh, you criticized Tim Keller. And anybody who then did start to wade into a little critical waters, like they had to spend 25 minutes affirming all the things they love about Tim Keller before they could make the one, one little tweet. I mean, this guy was really seen as just this kind of super, he was so good. He had no critic. Now he's got a lot of critics. He's got a lot of critics. And I think Piper was always more controversial in some circles, but now it's like I'm seeing videos from people like, John Piper, you're my brother Christ, man, I love you. And like, what are you doing, man? <laughs> and uh, and so people are kind of turning against him. And it's not, I think there's less criticism. These guys have, you know, they've gone liberal. They're pivoting left. They're doing this. And, you know, I really don't think that. I mean, again, if you go back and listen to Tim Keller's 2010 Lausanne conference speech, I don't think he's changed anything since then. In many ways, you know, his writing, his speech was prescient when he talked about, hey, you're going to have perpetual struggles around multiculturalism in urban churches. It's just going to be, you just better expect that. Um, I think I think he's been incredibly constant. Now, you know, he did sort of, I think, try to incorporate Charles Taylor and some of the things that he read later, but for the more or less, he's the same guy saying the same things and sometimes the exact same things. Uh, as he used to. And I think, you know, Piper has been very, very constant too. So I don't think these guys have, um, you know, really gone off track or something like that. Uh, not to say that I ever agreed 100% with them, but, you know, they're really, you know, I think they're they're really still solid guys. It's just, but they have really struggled to, you know, speak to the moment. And again, I, you know, I've sort of advocated, and maybe this is controversial, that you know, these guys ought to think about stepping back as public intellectuals. And that doesn't mean they need to go fishing or whatever, but like they're clearly not being effective. And they're actually causing a lot of damage to their own reputations because they just, you know, they just don't necessarily have, you know, they don't really have the insights. And again, if they thought people were really going off the rails or something, yeah, it's worth trashing your reputation. You know, we don't need to worry about too much about our reputation if we really think, hey, we're boldly declaring the truth. But stuff like Piper's recent article about if you want to get vaccinated but you feel like you can't get vaccinated because you're under all this peer pressure from all these conservative anti-vaxxers. I mean, like, he's speaking into such a niche consideration and just it just doesn't even make any sense, to be quite honest. So I and these guys, these guys kind of suck all the oxygen out of the room. I mean, it's, you know, everybody knows that America's kind of run by a gerontocracy now, and it's, it's kind of very late silence and early boomers. I've said, I usually say it's the birth years of 42 to 64, excuse me, to 54, 55. 55, they really kind of just run the country. And a lot of these guys have been big shots since the eighties. And, you know, they're still kind of big shots today. And, you know, they kind of grabbed the reins of leadership and they never let go and they never developed the leadership under them. And I think to some extent, the younger people, um, you know, haven't necessarily asserted themselves either. They've decided, you know, you can't let, you can't let Tim Keller over function for you, you know, for too long. At some point you got to stand on your own two feet, and take the measure of the time. So, I think these guys, to say that they're doing a good job or a bad job, they're not doing a bad job in terms of, I think their theology is all bad, but they're certainly doing a bad job in terms of being able to adapt to the times and find a way to contextualize what they're doing to the moment. They're really struggling with that. So I think there's a, there's sort of a big, um, 
call it divergence um, in, in these things. I don't think we get tar the elites. I think you have to look at different people. There's people I think are doing legitimately bad. There's people like De Young that you know I'm very high on because I think they're really stepping up. Then there's some other guys that I think are struggling, and, and maybe they'll turn the corner. You know, maybe those guys can can figure it out. But you know, it, it's they say it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. I think you know having built their whole ministry on you know, a set of like operating principles X, it's very hard to come into a completely new era, right? It's like being an old man. You know, I came from a technology background. So it's like being an old mainframe guy, an old COBOL coder. And now you're trying to write, you know, write like web apps on your phone. It's like, wow, that's a big transition. It's, it's hard to make. It's hard to make. And so, uh, and so that's what I'd say there. Now there's another definition of, of the elite that Kevin DeYoung sort of makes in the podcast, and he doesn't phrase it the way that I phrase it, but basically he would say, or sort of said, and I think is, is a legitimate way to define the elite is, you know, an elite is someone that other elites will talk to, right? If other people who are elites recognize you as sort of a peer or someone worthy of engagement with, then you've sort of been accepted into the club. So there's a validation function of having other elites, you know, anoint you as an elite. We can even think of this even going back to, um, you know, the whole concept of ordination even. It's like, hey, we are ordaining you and that is part of recognizing you in a role. There's a similar function there. You can think of it as a gatekeeping function. And frankly, this is a legitimate and valid function of elite leadership. Part of the challenge that we have today in America is there's not great gatekeeping. Uh, you know, we have too little gatekeeping in, in a, to a great extent. Now, I can't complain because I'm, I'm not a product. In a gatekeeping system, I probably, you wouldn't be listening to my podcast, right? Uh, but, you know, we have had a breakdown, not necessarily all to the good in gatekeeping. Uh, on the other hand, the old gatekeepers that do exist are not functioning well. So I think there's been a breakdown in gatekeeping. But I think this gets to something is that, you know, a quality method of Elite selection, validation, elevation is important. And again, Baltzell would have talked about this going back to, you know, the WASP establishment that they absorbed people into the upper class and then they, they dominated these things and you had to play by the rules, all this stuff. There's a certain set of standards. Uh, there's that. And maybe I will talk a little bit more about this in a future podcast because the Mormons are very interesting in how they select their leaders and how you become a leader within the Mormon church. And I think there's some things uh, to look at there. Um, but I think there's an example, I think there's a kind of an ironic example of DeYoung's own uh, take on elites, talk about other elites in their own article, in, in their own podcast. Because if you look at their podcast, the articles that they were discussing, where they discussed Mark Galley's piece, they discussed Carl Truman's piece, and then they discussed a piece by David French that he apparently wrote in response to Truman or something like that. So it was a response. And I think it's interesting. Who did they not mention? They did not mention John Eretz's piece from American Informer. Now, they may not have read that. So American Informer's new. They may not have come across him. But I think very clearly, importantly, they did not mention Jack Waters and Emma Posey's piece from the American Conservative. That one they, they clearly had to know about. One, because it's in a major publication, the American Conservative, people know it. And secondly, Mark Galley's piece was written specifically in response to the American conservative piece by Jack Water. But they're like, they just cut that one out of the picture. Okay, so Jack and Emma are very young, you know, not yet established. I mean, personally, you know, I would have, I, I think they should have mentioned that one because it's like, because Galley did riff off of that in his original piece. And, you know, you want to like honor a young person that has a hit, right? I mean, to sort of cut them out of, out of that, you know, not good, but that's one. They think about, okay, who do we elevate? Who do we not elevate, right? And similarly, the reason I even found this podcast is because somebody tweeted, hey, there's this discussion that these guys, and you know, Kevin DeYoung is talking about Aaron's positive, neutral, negative world framework. I'm like, well, that's interesting, so I'll listen to it. And he did talk about my framework. Uh, and yeah, you know, he didn't mention me though. So he didn't mention me, which is fine. Uh, that's fine. Um, and But I think that goes to show you, right, that these guys are very cautious about who they engage with, right? And who they don't engage with. They're, they're this, and this has been one of the biggest criticisms of this kind of big EVA organization is that they are extremely rigorous in their gatekeeping. And I think we see that here. 
you know, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. Um, you know, my, uh, I'm more bankable in the secular elite media, at least for now, we'll see how long that lasts, uh, than I am sort of in, in the Christian media. In a sense, I'm more elite in the secular world than I am in the Christian world, in the sense that, um, you know, stuff that I wrote was just picked up by the Financial Times. I've, I've been in the Financial Times a couple times recently. Uh, another piece I wrote, uh, that uh, DIY home piece, got picked up by the Atlantic, people writing that. Another observation I made on changing dynamics of corporate headquarters in, uh, you know, this kind of post-pandemic world and with the travails of Boeing and things like that, um, you know, got picked up by Bloomberg and the Washington Post. I'm like, well, this is kind of kind of gratifying. I'm getting a lot of hits lately. And then, of course, Rod Rear's written about me. Mark Growley's written about me. I uh, got something going to be doing first things. I Google my name on Gospel Coalition. And as, as far as I can tell, the Gospel Coalition, my name has never appeared in the Gospel Coalition, which I, I think is kind of interesting. And that's not to say that I think they're blackballing me or something. I, I would feel confident that if I sent them a pitch, here's an op-ed, and, you know, it was on point for what they wanted to do, um, you, you know, they would probably publish it. But I think the key is... You know, they're like, we're not necessarily keen to elevate this voice. And so I do think this is one of the things that you see you see going into it. And so and so that's one. And so definitely, by the way, my goal for these things like positive, neutral, negative world framework is that it def becomes so big that everybody talks about it without even knowing who came up with it. Right. If if you can't overflow the origin points um, of it, then you know, it's too small. If you think about any idea, it's like who came up with this idea, the most influential ideas, you can't really know who even originally came up with it. You know, you'd probably have to trace back, you know, trace back, trace back, and keep going and going and going. So that's kind of my goal. And I, I think this framework is super important and I want to see people doing it. As long as somebody else doesn't take the credit for it, which they don't, I don't care if I actually get any credit for it. So uh, that's important. But I do think this is an interesting function of um, of, of leadership is you know, essentially validating who do we engage with, who do we elevate, who do we not elevate. And again, it's a completely legitimate function uh, of that. Although, again, I would have really appreciated if these guys had mentioned Jack and Emma just because they're young and kind of getting their first big hit. Uh, so hopefully somebody will take, care, take that the next time. Last thing I want to talk about is um, uh, something that Kevin DeYoung also mentions, which is this idea of... Um, institutional considerations. And people who are kind of outside of institutions, like the Gospel Coalition, say someone such as myself, it's very easy to say, these guys ought to be saying this, these guys ought to be doing that. And But, you know, when you're inside of an institution, you do have institutional considerations that weigh upon what you can and can't do, right? And sometimes... You know, this kind of defend the institution. You know, people have covered up a lot of really terrible things uh, out of institutional consideration. So this can definitely go wrong. But it's really important to understand when people are part of a denomination or part of a leadership structure or part of an institution, you can't just go freelance everywhere. You have to be part of the institution. So I wrote a document probably 15, 20 years ago. I don't remember when I wrote it. Uh, at, when I was at a major consulting company, and it was called the New Senior Manager survival guide. And uh, it was something that's like, here's the lessons I learned when I got promoted to senior manager. And one of the things that I took out of this documentation or took out of this experience was at that level within the organization, which is one level, you know, at that time they had like staff, senior manager, senior manager, associate partner, partner. So that was the structure. So you're getting in towards the associate partner level. You're at the upper ends of the managerial ranks. And what I said is basically you are now part of the management team of this company. You might not think of it yet. You're, you know, you're like that young junior guy who says, I'm not an elite. There's 3,000 partners in this place. I don't get invited into these meetings. That's true. But now you're getting into that elite level, right? You're getting into that managerial class. And when you're in that class, you need to rep the organization. You know, when it was... Uh, you know, you and your buddies and your and your junior, and there's a webcast, and the CEO's coming up with some goofy change to the pay structure that nobody likes, right? Well, you can all kind of, you know, you know, go down to the bar and complain and kvetch and all that stuff. Well, you know, when you're when you're the more senior you get, the more that it is your job to represent the management team of the firm to more junior employees. They don't see the CEO of that company. They don't know him. Who do they know? You. 
you are the representative of management to that company, right? And it puts constraints on what you can and should say to your subordinates in that way. So it's very important when you're part of an organization that you're, you, you have to understand people have institutional considerations that are completely legitimate. So a lot of these guys in these quote unquote big EVA organizations have to think about these institutional considerations when they're making decisions. You know, I've thought a lot about this, uh, you know, for myself and how I structure what I do. And, you know, there's basically two ways you can approach things in the world. There's what I call the, uh, you know, I call it the inside game and the outside game. So the inside game here would be to sign on with Big Eva. And, uh, you know, so then you sign on the dotted line with Gospel Coalition Inc. or whatever, or any organization, sign on the line with the Heritage Foundation or the Center for the American Progress, right? Or whatever organization you're in. And now you're on the inside. So it's like, oh, I can influence this from the inside. This would be the faithful, I'm going to be faithfully present in this organization or whatever. Well, now, you know, you sort of are embedded in that institution. And what do you have to do? You have to play the game. You have to go along to get along, especially when you're junior, right? You're, uh, you don't have a lot of ability to speak up. And then as you go up through the ranks, you're probably being rewarded for compliance. So it sort of selects for kind of cautious personalities move up through the ranks. And in essence, you go to the inside and you, it's ineffective as a change agent. Uh, but if you're on the outside, right, you can say and do whatever you want. So from a standpoint of, you know, this, this big ever group, I can say and do, you know, anything I want. So that's very powerful. I, am, I do not have institutional considerations and that doesn't make me braver than them. It doesn't make me, you know, smarter than them. Maybe some of these people actually secretly all think the same thing I do on some topics. They just can't say it because I'm on the inside. So I have a lot of freedom. But what happens when you're on the outside? One, your visibility into the internal dynamics of organizations is not necessarily as good. Um, and secondly, the incentive structures of being on the outside are very bad. So if you think about the social media influencer world, for example, what draws clicks? What draws clicks is red meat, controversy, extreme positions, etc. And, you know, I especially like looking at videos that people are putting up about kind of evangelical stuff. You know, I generally don't watch a lot of videos or listen to a lot of podcasts because, quite frankly, I don't have time. But one of the things I love about YouTube videos, typically people have on turned on that you can see how many people watch the videos. So I just have to look at what is the subject? You know, who are they talking about if it's a person? You know, what is the style? And see, here's what draws traffic. Controversy draws traffic. Look at all these Trumpy e-celebs out there, you know? Or look at the various woke personalities. The more, if you want to kind of distinguish yourself within the field, when you're non-institutionally backed and you're eating what you kill, and right, and all that stuff, as I say, the incentive structure is to become a one extreme, much more extreme, extremely hostile and oppositional to kind of incumbents. And, and so that's what we end up with a lot of these kind of toxic, toxic dynamics. You're sort of pushed in that direction. And so, you know, believe me, I, I feel those pressures. There's a lot of things I don't want to do uh, with, with kind of my platform. Uh, you know, I, I, you know I, I'm trying to have serious discussions and I want to have serious discussions, but I realize, right, oh yeah, the market for serious discussions kind of on an independent basis is, is much more limited than the market for um, launching a bunch of attacks against Big Eva and you know, screeds and things like that and accusing people of being sellouts and stuff. And so, you know, probably I should be more aggressive on some things, but like, I, you know, that's just not the game I want to play. I want to try to stay there. And what you see is over time, that sort of thing can warp you um, if you're on the inside, if you're on, if you're on the outside too long in that sort of oppositional role, um, you can't, you, you can do it. And particularly, particularly if you're, if you're tied, if your success level isn't what you want, um, I see a lot of people sort of sort of get, uh, you know, it kind of kind of leads them in some some bad directions. It kind of leads them in some bad direction. That's what happened to a lot of those dissident right people, um, you know, for example, after they got doxxed and things like that. So uh, one of the reasons I think about this a lot is because I worked as a consultant. And the thing that consultants bring to organizations, you know, when I worked as a consultant, I always thought that, um, you know, the reason they hired us is because we were really smart. We're just so smart. We've got great frameworks. We've got great assets. 
and we can just come in here and like tell you what to do. Or maybe that, hey, you need some arms and legs to do stuff, right? And I'm like, wow, this is great. So then you know, I went out to clients, did all this work, and then I worked internal. I took an internal position at my company, and all of a sudden I realized like nobody cared what I thought anymore. When I was out at the client site, people cared what I thought. When I was internal, nobody cared what I thought. And I'm like, wow. And you know, this is a very long podcast. I should just do it in, in, in a second podcast follow up just on this point. But what I realized is um, when you were an internal to an organization, everything that you say is filtered through the lens of the box that you occupy on the org chart. And therefore, if you're down in the bowels of the organization, you're just kind of a minion. Whereas if you're a client, you kind of exist outside the org chart. You come in, you have the ability to go anywhere, talk to anybody, say anything, but you're constrained by your ethical duty to do what's right for your client, all of this stuff. And when it does right, it can be magic. It can unlock things that can never be unlocked internally. And so I've thought a lot about the value of that. The kind of what I call it, the, the person who's an outsider, but still has something of an insider status as well is very powerful. So I always thought about that. I, I always thought the ideal positioning for someone like me is to be 20 to 25% big EVA. And you can think, what does it mean to be 25? You can think of pay, you can think of whatever, you know, outlet of writing or whatever. Because then, you know, I've got skin in their game. They've got skin in my game. You know, if, if you're getting like 20, 25% of your money from somebody, you're going to think twice before you walk away from it, but they also don't own you either. Um, but in, in this kind of world, it doesn't actually work that way. So you can't be, you can't really be in or out. You have to be in, you can be in, you can be out, but you can't be in and out. And so, you know, one of the things that I'm very glad about uh, with American Reformer uh, is, you know, getting, you know, having an institution that we're building, being part of that, you know, helps keep me anchored in something that, you know, puts good constraints, puts good constraints, you know, already like, you know, Nate, you know, Ben and I don't always agree on everything, but we have to come to an agreement. And that having to come to an agreement is very healthy. And I think it makes things there. And I'm also working, I've also been working with Nate on his, um, his, you know, his, his new founding venture, you know, with Nate and, and Matt Peterson. I think that's great. It's great to be part of, part of an institution where you're too, I think it's, it's easy to look at the guys on the inside and say they've sold out, they're just going along to get along. And that's true. But I think there's also dangers in being on the outside uh, as well. So we do have to think about if you're an outsider, you do have to be understanding of the constraints that people on the inside have. You can't expect them to do what they do. But also, as importantly, maybe more importantly, you need to keep a cl you know, close check on yourself to make sure that the incentive structures of being uh, outside the power structures don't carry you to a place uh, that you don't want to go. So with that, I'll wrap up. Just some thoughts. Uh, again, that was a fire hose of data. Probably I could do an entire podcast or more podcasts just on any of these books. Maybe I should do some book podcasts. Uh, something to think about. Who are the elite? Who are the evangelical elite? Are they doing a good job? What are the considerations and constraints? And I hope this will help you sort through and make sense of some of the dynamics of what's going on in the world. Until next week, bye-bye.